Dr. Sam Chan is a former pastor, college president, and chancellor, but now serves as president emeritus of Biola Heights University. As a dream releaser, Dr. Sam Chan serves pastors, ministries, and businesses as a leadership architect and change strategist. He personally consults, mentors, and coaches some of the country's largest church pastors. He speaks regularly at leadership conferences, churches, corporations, leadership roundtables, ministers' conferences, seminars, and other leadership development opportunities. He was named in the top 30 global leadership gurus list and the singular vision for his life is to help others succeed. Dr. Sam Chan develops leaders through leadership consultations, leadership resources, and leadership speaking engagements. Ladies and gentlemen, give a warm welcome to the Great Leadership Conference, Dr. Sam Chan. What an honor and privilege to be with you here today, Pastor Tola. Thank you for the invitation. You are my dear friend and your wife, Pastor Kofu. Just wonderful people. I've had the privilege of traveling so many countries with you, uh, doing the Alpha Leadership and the great uh, uh, leadership conferences. And thank you so much for once more inviting me to be part of this great journey. I am totally amazed and impressed by the lineup of speakers that you have who will be coming and sharing. And these are not the speakers, these are practitioners who actually put into practice what they are going to share with you today. And then I am also so grateful for the Lord and his favor and grace on your life, Pastor Tola, to have leaders from all over the globe, literally, who are going to be part of this conference. Some of them are going to be part of this conference live. Some of them are going to be part of this conference on demand as the, uh, as the recording goes back out to them. But you have a global impact and a global footprint. And God has placed you as a steward of leadership all over the world. I have seen again and again how people look up to you how people admire you, how people honor and respect you, how people glean from you. And I've also seen you, how deeply you have cared for people. Pastor Tola, I've been in rooms with you, not on the platform, just on the platform, but in private rooms where there were pastors in the room. And I saw you, how you have put your arm around them, how you have encouraged them, how you've spoken to the lives how you have prayed over them, how you have walked difficult journeys with pastors and leaders in ministry and marketplace all over the world. And for that, we all are grateful for you, your life, your legacy, and the living inspiration that you bring to each one of us. My theme for today and my topic for today is restructuring your leadership roles in ministry and marketplace. So because I know the kind of leaders that will be on this call from all over the world, ministry and marketplace, what I want to do is not just give you information, but I want to frame what I'm going to share with you in a very specific way. And my framing is that I want to start conversations with you and your leadership. So what, the way I prepared my teaching and my notes are I'm going to give you three things about this, five things about this, seven things about that, six things about this, two things about this. I'm going to give you lists. And the reason I'm giving you lists is so that you can take the conversation. And after this call is over, after GLC 2022 has concluded, that you will be able to take this with your leadership teams, and you could be in any country. These are cross-cultural things I'm going to talk about. And you can help your team to restructure your leadership roles in ministry and marketplace. Now, I have friends who have fixed equipment, who have remodeled their houses simply by watching how-to videos on YouTube. You can fix anything. You can get a tutorial information on anything 
from YouTube nowadays. However, restructuring your leadership roles in ministry and marketplace is not a YouTube job. I do not recommend that for you. Because restructuring, R-E, restructuring clearly implies that at one time there was a structure. The word re, almonds means again, repair, regain, repent, restructure, redo. So re means there's an assumption that there was a structure already in place. I also know that remodeling, rebuilding, restructuring is messy work. Uh, a few years ago, my wife had this idea that we need to restructure, remodel, redo our kitchens and our bathrooms, just a half the house to be redone. And I remember how messy it was, how we had to relocate from where we were living, our master bedroom area, to go to another part of the house. And it was six plus months of people coming in and out. And what they had to do, first of all, was to tear down what existed. Now, hear me now. This is the most important part of restructuring. You Restructuring does not mean you already have this and you come behind it and paste on and add on something. Now, that's not what it's about. What it is about is that you have to tear down. Number two, you have to clean out. Number three, you have to have a new blueprint. You got to have new materials to rebuild and restructure this place. Let me go over those steps with you very carefully. You have to tear down. You got to clean out. You got to get a new blueprint. You got to have new materials. And then you're going to rebuild on top of that. So I'm sure that every speaker coming behind me is going to talk about different aspects of what that really means. So let me start with my list. Two foundational understandings. Two foundational understandings. Number one, all restructuring is a critique of the past. All restructuring is a critique of the past. So that means if you restructure your church building, it means that you are improving whatever there was. It is a critique of the past. You are improving on the past. Number two, all restructuring will be offensive to someone very on a very personal level. Please know this. So, so let me stop right here. And I appreciate the team. You can leave the screen up there if you want to. So I, as I talk through that, the, 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 the team, for, uh, Pastor Tola, you have an amazing team who have put this thing together. And I want to applaud them for the details that they worked through. So the first point is all restructuring and critique of the past. But most people, most of you will not restructure for the second reason. You will not restructure for the second reason because it will be offensive to someone on a very personal level. There it is again. Thank you. Thank you so much. Leave that up there for a moment as I talk about the number two. All restructuring will be offensive to someone on a very personal level. And this number two reason is why most of you are going to be hesitant apprehensive and reluctant about restructuring. Because when you restructure, you're going to offend somebody. When you restructure, you're going to reposition somebody. When you restructure, you're going to remove somebody. When you restructure, you're going to promote somebody. When you restructure, you will demote somebody. When you restructure, you will fire somebody. When you restructure, you'll move somebody's program out of the way. When you restructure, you're going to bring somebody else in there. And whenever you do that, please know you're not talking to a synthetic entity that is intangible. You're talking to human beings. And this number two reason is the most important reason most of you are going to struggle with restructuring. 
So I thought I'd st start with giving you your greater he greatest hesitancy. It's not going to be a thing. It's going to be a person or persons. You restructure your church. Some people are going to get angry and leave. You restructure your business. You might lose some customers before you gain some customers. So those are the two foundational understandings. Let me go to my next list. So there are five restructuring items of focus, five restructuring items and focus. And if uh, the great GLC team can put those up there on the screen, that'll be very, very helpful to everybody who's watching me and taking notes. Five restructuring items of focus. Number one, number one is personal. Personal is how you are thinking as a leader. The next screen, please. How you are thinking as a leader. There we go. Thank you so very, very much. And leave that up there. Leave the screen up there. I'd much rather people look at that than look at me because you can still see and hear me. Personal. How you as a leader are thinking about this. Your excitement. Circle the word and. Your fears. So no restructuring will happen. Oh, let me say it another way. All restructuring happens with your thinking. And as you start thinking about it, you're going to get excited at one end because you're going to see possibilities. And you're going to get fearful at the other hand because you're going to see liabilities. So they're going to see possibilities and pitfalls. Number two, personnel. Those who work for you with pay. How are you going to focus on those who are working for you. Now, we're going to, I'm going to talk more about that in just a minute. But the, the people pieces are the most important pieces because proper people placement prevents problems. Let me give that to you again. Proper people placement prevents problems. Let's say that together. Everyone together. One, two, three. Proper people placement prevents problems problems because we know two things number one all your problems whatever you're having can be traced to a person or persons and all your solutions are also a person or persons so number one was personal number two is personnel number three is processes how you do things so this is very important, especially on the other side of the global challenges we have come through all over the world. Global challenges were not just the pandemic, but they were economic, they were social, they were cultural, they were religious, they were political. They are now dealing, coming out into recessions and even some in great inflation all over the world. Uh, people's buying power has shrunk greatly. So how you do things, because if pastors are wanting to do church how it used to be, that's going to be very difficult. How you did business, that's going to be something that will be part of our restructuring conversation just a few minutes. Your processes, how you do things. Number four is places, places, locations on your org chart. Now, that's very important. So every one of you, if I to come to an organization and ask you for your org chart, you'd show me boxes. There, there are, you are, might be at the top or you might be the number two as the executive. And then there are boxes and then the boxes under that as well. You have to rethink the boxes themselves before you rethink the people who are in the boxes. Because what I have discovered, now I'm a leadership consultant. I have clients on every continent except Antarctica. I've got clients everywhere. And I can tell you that one of the things we have discovered is there have been new boxes added to your org chart. There have been boxes that have moved up and down and sideways on your org chart. And even more importantly, there are some boxes on your org chart that are not needed 
anymore. And that, my dear friends, is going to be your bigger challenge than adding boxes, than moving boxes. The boxes that need to be removed from your org chart will cause you more existential angst. It's going to cause you more problems. It's going to cause you more internal fears and apprehensions, hesitancy, and disappointments than anything else, places. Number five is people. People. All who are affected by the outcomes, volunteers, family, members of your church, customers, etc. All who are affected by your ecosystem. So it's not just the people that you pastor. It's not just the customers that you uh, serve. It's not just the vendors that you help. It's not just your economic social bubble. There are lots of people who are affected by how you restructure. So when you restructure something, it's not just for you, you've got to think about the domino effect of what it is gonna happen. We call those transitional issues in people's life. So before I give you the six questions to ask yourself, let me review this. Five restructuring items of focus. Personal, how are you thinking? Personnel, those who are working for you. Processes, how you do things. Places, the location on your org chart. And remember under that, removing a box, demoting a box is going to be your biggest challenge in restructuring. And number five, the people who are affected by the outcomes. Let me move from there to six questions to ask yourself. Now, all of this is about restructuring. Six questions to ask yourself. Question number one. What is working? What is working? Let me go over one, two, three, four, and then I'm going to come back to number one. What is working? Question number two, who is still effective? Question number three, what is not working? And question number four, who is no longer effective? Let's talk about those four. What is working? Now, the reason I want you to think about what is working as opposed to question number three, what is not working, is that very everybody knows what is not working. In fact, every staff meeting you have, every business meeting you have, every board meeting you have, every director's meeting you have, every, every kind of team meeting you have, you talk about what is not working. And you talk about who is no longer effective. You talk about those two every meeting. But very few organizations have I found who are willing to talk about one and two. When was the last time? When was the last time your executive team, your board, your directors, your, your department leaders, your vice presidents, however you're organized, because I'm talking to ministry and marketplace people. When was the last time you devoted an entire meeting to what is working? What are we successful at? What is producing great results? What is bringing us the greatest ROI, return on investment? Where are we being the best uh, from a scale of zero to 100? We are a consistent zero to 10. We are a consistent nine, 10 being the highest and one being the lowest. Where, where are we doing? Where are we winning? Where are we dominating? And who is still effective? That goes along with the first question. When was the last time you met in a room and didn't talk about what's not happening, didn't talk about what's not working, didn't talk about who is not working, did not talk about what went wrong, but you talked about what went right? What is working? What is still effective and who is still effective and then you can go to number three and four but see number three and four you talk about constantly number three and four you think about constantly number three and four you plan about constantly number three and four might be the reasons you are on this call but before you get to number three and four what is not working who is no longer effective focus your time and what is working what is 
who is still effective. Now, if I could put brackets and parentheses around these four things I've talked to you so far about, what is working? Who's still effective? I want to call assets. These are our assets. These are our competitive advantages. Three and four are liabilities. Things that are not working out. People that are not working out. Now, because in restructuring, we have already focused on our liabilities, what is not working out, I wanted to actually start with your assets. What and who is working? Because you cannot restructure till you have itemized your assets. Assets, liabilities. That's basic business, is it not? These are my assets. These are my liabilities. This is my income. This is my outgo. This is my uh, things I can expect to gain. And here are my losses. But most of us start with our losses rather than starting with our gains. And I want to encourage you to start thinking about your assets versus your liabilities. Question number five, is my present system, I'm going to come back to the word system, is need of reorganizing. So what is the system? If I was to draw out an organizational chart, if you had your boxes, you know how we do boxes everywhere. If you had an organizational chart, the, the boxes without any names in it, the boxes without any names in it is called a system. That's important. So let me go ahead and define structure and come back to number five, because I've got more to send in number five. Boxes without names in it. So it could be finances, marketing, ministry, youth, IT, whatever those boxes are, are your boxes without any names in it. Is a system. When you put names in those boxes, it becomes a structure. Now, the reason I'm differentiating that is that most of our conversation is on the names in the boxes. So-and-so is not working out. So-and-so is not doing right. Rather than the box itself and its own position. So under the system, I want to give you five questions to assist you in creating systems. Five questions to ask yourself, and here go. Hey, Pastor Tola, you have an amazing team. Look at them. They're putting it up there. My notes are right there for everybody. After this call is over, they can, you can send the notes out. You can sell the notes. I don't know whatever you want to do. You can write books on these notes. Just put me a little credit over there. Five questions to assist in creating system. Number one, what defines us? What defines us? That answers the question, who are we? What defines us? What defines you? So I am defined in many different ways. People I work with call me a dream releaser. They have a dream. I come by next to them and help them release that dream. For example, Pastor Tola, who's the convener, organizer, and the head of GLC and Alpha Leadership, he has a dream to resource leaders worldwide. He has a dream to be a resource person to ministry and marketplace. He has a dream to help people go to the next level. And the reason I'm on this call is because I'm a dream releaser. I help him. It's not my dream even though it is, but this is his dream. This call is his call. I'm here to help him. So what defines us? What defines you? Number two, what are your deliverables? What are your deliverables? What is it that you deliver? Do you have a service? Do you have an actual product? Do you uh, uh, sell your time? What is it that you are actually delivering to your people? What is your deliverable? you got to be very, very clear about that. If I was to come to your church service, what is it that you are delivering to me? 
what is it that if I was to come to your business, can I, as your customer, tell you, the provider, what your deliverables are? Number three, what are your delivery systems? Now, we found out in the pandemic very quickly that your delivery systems immediately, overnight, pivoted to the camera. Huh. Half the world had not heard about Zoom. But now everybody is Zooming because Zoom became a verb. <laughs> a noun became a verb. It became a doing thing. People were face live, uh, Facebook live. I have so many pastor friends who had no idea what Facebook live was, who didn't know what Zoom was. Your delivery system. Before Zoom became what it was, remember there was a thing called Skype? But somehow the delivery system, there was a battle between the delivery system. And then we started finding out that there was a time early on during the pandemic that people used to watch us on, uh, online, live. So you announced your church service, we will be live at 10 o'clock. And people, wherever they were at, in their homes, in the bedroom, in their kitchens, in their living room, in the drawing room, they, you know, they, they went online and watched you live. And then we started seeing the shift that people, not as many people watching it live, now people start watching it on demand. So all of a sudden, YouTube came up. I'm just giving you some examples to think, what are your delivery systems? How do you deliver your services? How do you deliver your product? I used to travel. I used to travel. Pastor Tola will tell you, I used to travel about 200 flights a year all over the world. 200 flights a year all over the world. And then I had, I had slowdown plans. And they all failed. Every slowdown plan I had failed. Then God gave me a stop it plan. And this year, I will travel 20 flights. 200 flights to 20 flights. But my business has increased 47%. You know why? Because we discovered delivery systems. I can talk to people globally like this rather than having to travel, get picked up, go to a hotel, go to a conference room, back to the hotel, back to the airport. Instead of doing all of that, here I am just talking to you and talking to people all over the world. What your delivery system? Number four, you'll see me coming back to number four in different ways again and again. Number four, who are our drivers. These are the people who make it happen for you. These are people who, for example, I've already said this, but bears repeating. Pastor Tola put together an A plus team to organize this call that we are on right now. I have received, my office has received multiple emails. Last week, we got on a trial run. So I'm talking to you because last week, the entire team, Pastor Tola's team, met with me online. The drivers are making it happen. Now, Pastor Tola can be as brilliant as he wants to be, and I can be as prepared as I want to be. But if the drivers are not driving to make this happen, putting the screens up, uh, go following along with me uh, and doing everything that they do, it wouldn't happen. It's always about the people. And number five, aligning our dollars. I didn't say, do you have enough dollars? I think aligning our dollars. So if there's alignment between your dream and alignment between your resources, the alignment between your vision and alignment between your resources, you'll be good. You know, the Bible says, without a vision, people perish. Can I add to that without being sacrilegious? <laughs> without resources, without money, there is no vision. But when you have a vision and start aligning your resources to that, you 
start creating systems that are equitable to the location you're in. So before I move on from here, I have a big question, really, really, really big question for all of you leaders right now, because my assumption is that many, many, many of you are seasoned leaders in ministry and marketplace, church, corporate, sacred, secular. And here's my question for you. Knowing what you know now, with all of your curated wisdom, with all of your years of experience, if you could redo, re-systematize your organization, if you could get a whiteboard and remove all the boxes, all the boxes, and start redrawing the boxes, how would you organize yourself? How would you organize yourself? With all the wisdom you have now, with all the excitement you have now, with all the fears you have, with all the disappointments, with all the joys, with all the fulfillment, with all the heartache, with all the people experience, with all the system experience, with all the administrative experience, if you could reorganize a whiteboard, move all the boxes and start rebuilding your organization, what would that look like? Because you see, before you restructure, you must re-systematize. Because structure, remember, are the people in the boxes. Systems are the boxes themselves. Do you actually need that box anymore? Do you need a new box? Do you need this box to move up? Do you need this box to move down? Do you need this box to report into this box now? Because till you have that system in place. So I'm, I'm sitting inside a, a studio right now. At one time, wherever I'm sitting, there used to be uh, shrubbery and plants and trees and forest and woods. Nothing was developed here. But some developer came by this piece of land years ago and said, wonder what would be like if we built ABC, the system. Wonder what this box will look like and this box will look like and this box will look like before they started putting Sam Chand in that room, before they put this chair in this room, before they put this wall in this room, before they painted the walls in this room, before they put a desk in front of me, before they gave me all this, there had to be a system. So here's my question. Is my present structure in need of organizing. So structure is people. And you ask three questions. You ask three questions. Question number one, who to retain? Question number two, who to release? And question number three, who to reassign with retraining? Who to retain? who to release, who to re reassign with retraining. Just a few thoughts about that. What I have done, so I've been a youth pastor, I've been a senior pastor, I've been a university president, and now I'm a consultant to corporations and to churches all over the world. And I ask people if they would indulge me in their restructuring by making a list of all the people, paid and volunteers, and ask three simple questions behind each name. So let me use myself. My name is Sam Chan. Should we retain Sam Chan? Should we release Sam Chan? Should we reassign Sam Chan and retrain him for his new assignment? What do we do with Sam Chan? Now, in the United States of America is where I'm located. I live in Atlanta. In the United States of America, I encourage leaders in ministry and marketplace to ask this question in November. First part of November. Why first part of November? Because if you're going to retain me, that tells me I need to get ready for January. If you're going to release me, you can release me in November 
And if you want to be generous and gracious with me for my service, you can release me in November and pay me through the end of the year. So that gives me, as, a, as, a, as an employee, as a team member, that gives me about six weeks or so to get another job. I can go through my holiday season with pay and I will know ahead of time. And if somebody is going to get upset and leave, they can leave during these two months. Reassignment is important because now you can retrain me during those six, eight weeks. Because when you start January, unfortunately, most leaders try to reorganize, restructure in January. No, no, no. In January, you should be ready to go, ready to run the race. January 1st, bam, you should be ready to go. Do all of your restructuring. Remember, I started by saying all of your tearing down, all of your cleanup, all of your repurposing, all the new material, all the new people. Do that in the last two months of the year so you can start the year with a bang. Unfortunately, I just don't understand it. Unfortunately, leaders all over the world make the same mistake. They say we're going to start the new year. But they start the new year limping because they will start making restructures and reorgs in January. That means they have to clean up through February and March. And you already lost the best years, the best months of the, of the year. So how would you reorganize? I have a question for you. I have a question for you. Imagine for a moment that you're going to leave where you're at, leave your location. You're gonna leave Baltimore. You're gonna leave Houston. You're gonna leave Seattle. You're gonna leave Lagos. You're gonna leave Nairobi. You're gonna leave Harare. You're gonna leave Johannesburg, wherever you're at. Sydney, Auckland, Delhi, Calcutta. You're gonna leave wherever you're at right now. And you're going to relocate your business. You're going to relocate your church, your entire family, a thousand miles away, you go, or ten thousand miles away. However, but you're going to just totally leave where you're at and go somewhere else. And if you could choose five people in your church or five people in your corporation, your company, to take with you, not counting family members, not counting family members. If you could take only five people with you to restart that company, to restart that church, to relaunch your business, to relaunch another church a thousand miles away from where you're at, who are the five people you take with you? Who are the five people you would take with you? Now, I know some of you are saying, well, I will, if I have a church, I'll need uh, somebody to do administration, somebody to do finances. I'll need somebody to do worship. I will need youth, whatever it might be. Or in business, you're going to say, I'm going to have to take somebody as a CEO, COO, CFO. I'll need somebody for marketing, somebody for IT. Don't think like that because that is structure. If you can think of systems and people who have your culture, who have your DNA, who are loyal to you, who get it, who can make it happen, who are those five people you would take with you? The five people you would take. Most people have a hard time coming up with five. But I have a, I've saved a harder question for you behind that. The harder question is, if there are people on your team right now who you would not take with you to relaunch, start over somewhere else, why are they on your team now? Let me ask that again. Because that question is meant to explore what you are thinking about restructuring. If there are people on your team right now that you would not take with you to that new location, why do you still have them with you right now? Now that, my dear friends, if you can answer that question with brutal honesty, you will make a major shift 
towards restructuring. So what are the five questions to streamline your organization? We're talking about restructuring. What are the five questions to ask as you streamline your organization? Question number one, what to start? What to start? This is an amazing time to start something. I love what Pastor Tola is doing right now. He's gone global. He's expanded Alpha into GLC. He has uh, brought on uh, people from ministry and marketplace. He created a team. He didn't get in a hurry. He has taken his time. This thing has been planned for months and months. People have been working on the technology, on the media, on the promotion, on the administrative side of things. People like me have been given a very clear direction as to what we need to do, what we don't need to do, when to show up, what to do, how the question be answered. I mean, a lot has gone into this. You have an opportunity to start something. More things have started. More people have moved up the ladder during this difficult time because they are willing to start something. Now, let me tell you who makes money in our world. So I'm gonna to talk to all the corporate leaders just for a moment. The people who make money in the world are people who solve problems. Everything you will buy today, everything you ever bought in your life was a problem that was solved. I'm sitting in a chair. At one time, people used to sit on tree stumps. It's a problem solved. I got lights in this room. There used to be darkness at one time. That's a problem solved. I'm, I'm doing a Zoom with you and other platforms is going out on. It's a problem solved. I'm wearing a shirt. At one time, I didn't have clothes. Years ago, it's a problem solved. I have a, I have a pen in my hand. This is a problem solved. If you want to make money, you have to remind yourself, every problem gets monetized. I have, I have a friend who's in the printing business, printing business. He told me in 2021, in May of 2021, he said, Sam, I have made more money in the first six months of 2021 than I would have made in two years. You know what he was doing? He was printing signs. Signs that said six feet apart. Signs which said masks required. Signs which said vaccination this way. Signs that said different signage that was needed during the pandemic. There was a problem. He monetized it. What to start? Question number two is a harder one. Harder one. Definitely a harder one. What to stop? What to stop. So this is what I would do if I was you as a leader. I would get my team together and ask them only question number one. So there are five questions. Don't go through all five of them in one meeting because they are different poles. They're totally different sides of the same continuum. So I'd get my team together and ask them one simple question. What should we start? And don't make decisions. This is a no decision meeting. What should we start? And get a whiteboard and just list on there. You can have people explain what they mean by that. You can dig further into that. You can get clarification on that. But just ask people what to start. Get ideas, ideas. ideas. You know how you get great ideas? You get great ideas because you have a lot of good ideas. What to start? Second question, that's in a group. Second question has to be asked individually. Because if you get 10 people in a room and you ask them what to stop, even though everybody, nine of the 10 will know what needs to be stopped because the 10th person is what needs to be stopped. The 10th department is what needs to be stopped. They're not gonna say that in front of that person. So those are individual meetings. You would meet with each one and ask them one simple question. In this organization, in this church, in this corporation, if we could stop one thing, what would that be? Now, what does stopping do? 
it redirects resources, redirects focus, redirects energies, redirects personnel, redirects money, redirects attention, redirects everything. Because when you stop doing this, all of a sudden you have resources that were going here. Now, the reason you need to do that is because I have noticed in organizations that are unfortunately our best resources go to things that are not working. Isn't it incredible the kind of things that we do? We send our best people to the departments that are not working. We send the most money to the departments that are not working. We talk most in our meetings about departments that are not working. We give more focus and attention to what is not working. It doesn't make sense to me. So as a leadership consultant, as an organizational strategist, I want to say to you, stop putting your best people and your best resources into areas that are non-productive, but that will only happen if you ask question number two, what to stop. Number three, what to sustain. That means here are things we're gonna continue doing. We will continue to, we will sustain these five things. What are things that we are going to sustain? Number four, what to suspend. Now suspend is very important. Suspend means that I'm going to take what I need to make a decision on and delay the decision, defer the decision, not deny, delay the decision. So right now, we are sitting in the month of September, or 2022. And there are some things that if you're not careful, you're going to talk about it every week, every month. But there are decisions that you can say, this is a decision we will make. This is a decision we need to make, but we will make it in January of 2023. Now, what does that do? It clears up space. It gives you margin. You can redirect resources. You don't have to keep talking about it again and again. You suspend a decision, not deny it, only defer it for another time. Number five, what to speed? What to speed? Every organization is doing two, maybe three things that are bringing it the highest returns. Every corporation is selling two or three things that are bringing them the highest returns. Every church is doing two or three things that is bringing it the greatest amount of encouragement, members, resources. What are those two or three things and how can you get behind them and speed those things? So before I move on to six strategic leadership skills that you need to restructure, let me give you the five questions one more time. What to start, what to stop, what to sustain, what to suspend, and what to speed. Let's go to six strategic leadership skills needed during restructuring. Six strategic leadership skills needed during restructuring. Number one, anticipation. Anticipation simply says, what lies ahead by keeping your eyes on your members, your customers, bottom up, not bottom down. That means you got to keep your eyes on where your members and customers are. And get input from the grassroots. I want to ask you a question. If you were digging holes, if you were digging trenches, if you were digging with shovels in my previous life back in 1973, 74, 75, here in the United States of America, I have done jobs in which all day long I would dig trenches, dig holes, dig foundations for, for, for buildings. I, I dug with a shovel. And if you were a company that made shovels, tell my question. If you wanted the best ideas to improve the shovel, who would you go to? Would you go to the engineer who's got amazing software on how to improve a shovel 
in the engineering department on the 18th floor of the high rise on your campus? Or would you come to Sam and say, Sam, you use a shovel every day, eight hours, 10 hours a day. Look at your hands. You've got blisters and calluses on your hands. Look at your shovel. It is so well used. You use it every day. You use it to make a living. Sam, if you could redesign the shovel to make your job easier, how would you restructure this shovel? But you know what we don't do? We don't ask the, the hole digger. We don't ask the volunteer. We don't ask the salesperson. We don't ask our receptionists, our secretary. We don't ask the department leaders. We don't ask the average church member. How can we improve? Because what happens is we go to the department, yeah, we go to the executive level and we assume that people here need this and people here want this, but we never ask the people themselves. Anticipation, what lies ahead by keeping your eyes out there. Navigation, number two. Restructuring is not a once a year item. It's ongoing as needed. Don't wait till the end of the year. Restructure when you need to. Because the longer you wait to restructure, the greater your losses. So restructure, restructure as needed. It is not just a once a year. So, you know, there are people who have their companies, the churches, and they go away to a retreat or some other place and, and they come up with these restructuring. I think that is great. That's wonderful. Please do more of that. However, do not relegate restructuring to a calendar time on your calendar. Restructure as needed. So I, earlier on, I said to you, November, so you can be ready. Now, that is something that you can count on. But if you needed to restructure in April or May, do it in April and May as well as in November. So November is on the list but do it as needed. Number three, communication, communication. During restructuring, over-communicate. Over-communicating during restructuring is necessary. Uh, the other day, uh, my wife and I were traveling through uh, North Carolina in a car and there was a major highway construction and major traffic backed up. And I mean, it was, it was, it was just uh, really bad. It was obvious it's still gonna be years before they're gonna be able to complete the construction. And I said to my wife, her name is Brenda. I said to Brenda, Brenda, I wonder what we like if the Department of Transportation created a five minute or less video saying we will be restructuring this highway. And to restructure the highway is going to take us three years, five years, whatever. But here are the steps into building a highway. We'll have to tear out the old. We'll have to bring in new dirt. We'll have to lay down rebarb or wires down. We'll have to put concrete in there. We'll have to do this. We'll have to do piping in there. We'll have to run this in there. We'll have to do this. We'll have to, there'll be five layers of it. And it's going to be, we got to put lighting in there. I mean, just tell me step by step, communicate with me what is going on. Because if you don't, there'll be people like me who are traveling the highway saying, wow, what a mess, what a mess, what a mess. When are they going to finish with this? It's been years. Wonder what they're doing. I don't see anybody working here. They never do anything. Boy, there's going to be another 20 years. Instead of me as a customer, instead of me as a church member, instead of me as your client, instead of me as a customer, having to wonder what's going on, over-communicate during times of restructure. Because if you don't over-communicate, let me tell you, they're going to come up with their own narrative. So whoever controls the narrative and the timeline is in control. Let me say that again. That's gold right there. Whoever controls the narrative and the timeline is in control. So if you, as a leader, 
want to lead, you've got to control the narrative over communicating and the timeline. Number four, listening. And you will see my notes right there. Listening, especially to what you don't want to hear during times of reset. Listening to what you don't want to hear. Oh, I know you're saying, Sam, you should have never said that. But I'm saying it. Because what we want is people say, ah, good job. That's going to be so good. Oh, I'm so excited about it. Can't wait. That is great and wonderful, but that's not the helpful thing during restructuring. During restructuring, you got to be willing to listen. Willing to listen to those things you don't want to hear. Number five, learning. Quick and constant learning. Mentally, people change. Tactical, strategic. Keep learning. Learn quick, learn fast, learn so that no one will ever blame you for not keeping up with all the progress that has gone on. And number six is leading. 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 This is what we call deep sea the what and the why. Number six is leading. Leading. Now, in leadership, you've got to do two things that are strategic. Everything else is tactical. Let me explain that to you. Leading is when you deep seed only two things, what and why. What and why. What are we restructuring and why are we restructuring? Please get this. Please get this. Because if you're not careful, you will run towards the tactical. And the tactical is who, when, where, how, how much, how often, with who, evaluation, assessment. Those are all good questions, but they are secondary questions. I call them tactical questions. There are only two strategic questions so as a leader, because all of you who are listening to me right now are leaders at some level in your organization. You as a leader have to be clear about the what and the why when you are restructuring. So before I go to my conclusion, I want to give you a gift. I want to give you a gift. I want to give you a gift. I want to give every one of you all over the world a leadership journal called Avail. I published the journal. It is five color, glossy, Christian leadership for ministry and marketplace. I'm going to give you a website in just a moment. You can go to that, get the first year free. If you live in the United States of America, you can get this in your mailbox. Everyone in your church, if you want to, can get this in your mailbox. Everyone in your leadership can get the mailbox. There's a QR code uh, on screen on there. If you want to go to a website, it is theartofleadership.com. Or you can just take a picture of the QR code. Yeah, I see you doing that. I see you doing that. Wow. All of so many of you are doing that right now. Go into the QR code and it will take you right to theartofleadership.com. If you are in another country that does not receive mail from the United States, you can receive this in your iPad, on your computer, on your telephone as a digital copy of Leadership Journal. I would love for thousands of you all over the world to get this Next year's free. It is a quarterly leadership journal simply called Avail. And it's all about structure, restructure, resystematization, and articles from thought leaders, practical leaders, corporate leaders, church leaders. And you can just take a picture of that on your screen. And I am hoping that thousands of you will start receiving this. That's my free gift to you for Pastor Tola. He's always saying, what resources can you bring to the conference? So I'm not selling anything. I'm just giving away free. With that in mind, I'm going to give you four items of focus during restructuring. Four items of focus during restructuring. Number one, courage for restructuring. Number two, stamina during restructuring. Number three, sustainability of the organization. 
And number four, scalability of the organization. Let me speak a little bit on each one of them, and then I will uh, throw it back to the team for any questions or answers that might be. Number one, courage. Please hear me on this. It'll take every ounce of courage you have to restructure. Restructuring is difficult. If restructuring was easy, we wouldn't be having this conference on restructuring. If Pastor Tola could have said, you know, restructuring is easy. Everybody can restructure. He would have never organized this conference around that theme of restructuring. The reason Pastor Tola has organized this conference around restructuring, the reason he's put time, attention, focus, resources, money, team behind restructuring is because he knows how difficult it is. And the difficulty comes from the courage that is needed as a leader to make restructuring possible. I can tell you from my life, that's why I wrote the book, Leadership Pain. Leadership Pain has become a bestseller globally. It, I've written 27 books and Leadership Pain has become the best seller of any of the 27 books I've written. Why? Because there's pain in leadership and you will experience major pain in restructuring. Now, why am I saying that to you? Because reality is your best friend. But you also need to know that if you're going to be a leader, you cannot be a leader without courage. Number two is stamina. Stamina during restructuring. Restructuring is not an overnight thing. Restructuring is not just few of you making a decision, announcing it, and that's it. Restructuring will take stamina from you. It is not a sprint. It is a marathon. Restructuring needs internal stamina, emotional stamina, relational stamina, resources stamina, financial stamina, organizational stamina. It's going to take stamina on your part. Sustainability of the organization. That means I'm restructuring so that my organization goes on. And then number four, scalability that it can grow. You remember the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus when he says, to his disciples, go forth and, and bring forth fruit, number one. Number two, that your fruit should remain. Bringing forth fruit is scalability, growing. That your fruit should remain is sustainability. So you're, you're, you're restructuring because you want your organization to continue to last, to be sustainable, to be your legacy. And you're also growing your organization, restructuring your organization to, to grow, sustain, and scale. To live long and to scale and to grow. I have given you all kinds of lists today. And the purpose of my giving you those lists was so that you can have resources to take those lists, put your own context inside of it or around it, package it how you need to, and ask those questions, lead those thoughts to your organization. Because restructuring is not for people who don't have courage, but you are a courageous leader. I encourage you to restructure. Let me throw the ball back to Pastor Toll. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Sam Chand. Uh, once again, you've taken me back to school, you know, so thank you again, my goodness. I can't, I can't believe this. There's so much learning, you know, for me to do. I hope we have all been blessed today. Uh, we really appreciate Dr. Sam Chand. Um, we'll quickly go to the question and, you know, answer sessions. If you're here to uh, write in your question, please do so in the chat box and uh, uh, we'll try and see if we can cover everything. There's a whole lot, you know. Uh, but for the first question for Dr. Chan Chan, how do you motivate um, your followers intellectually while restructuring the organization? You know, um, and you talked a little bit about that when you talked about restructuring, you know, will affect people. 
Do you understand? So how, how do we motivate everybody to be on board? I am reminded of a simple thought that I have lived my life by. Never lead people anywhere till you have taught them. You got to teach people before you lead them where you're going. So God always tells people, I'm going to take you there. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. Jesus here for three and a half years. He kept talking about what will happen, what will happen. And I think sometimes we do not lead people intellectually because we think of this as a something that we've got to do. No, it's not something that you do. It is a lifestyle. So to answer the question, if you could draw a line, say, so, and, and put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten being accomplishing the restructure. From one to three is nothing but teaching about the what and the why. The what and the why. One through three is just teaching about what and why. You don't even start planning your restructure to four and five. Restructuring does not start till your people have understood this is what we hope to do and this is why we want to do that. So if I was around the table with you, Pastor Tola, you would very succinctly describe for me what GLC is doing and why GLC is needed. What and why. Once those two intellectual pillars are in the ground, now you can go to further down the road. Unfortunately, Pastor Tola, most people think, oh, I can just do this like this. And all they do is they create problems. Because here's my second paradigm. Things don't go wrong. They start wrong. That's an important sentence. Things don't go wrong. They start wrong. And starting right means answering the two fundamental questions again and again and again. Jesus spent nothing but three and a half years with his disciples trying to explain to them the what and the why. And because of that, the disciples were able to go into the book of Acts. And here we are. So intellectually prepare people on the what and why. Take your time on it. If you are in a hurry to restructure, you will burn out early on. This is a marathon. How do we ensure an effective feedback loop within the systems and the structures? You know, how do we ensure that uh, you get, you know, feedbacks that is going to help what you are trying to achieve? So we always ask people for feedback, but all feedback is contingent on the level of trust for you. I can go asking people all the questions, the right questions in the right way, in the right location, at the right time. But if they don't trust me, they're not going to give me feedback, honest feedback, mm. brutal feedback, feedback that I probably do not want to hear. And one of the things I've found is the trust gap. That's a good, those two are important words. The trust gap between those who are asking for feedback and those who are giving feedback has to be narrowed. And if the trust gap exists, you will get things like, oh, everything is good. Everything is fine. Oh, we love it here. This is wonderful. But you know they are saying something different to people they trust. Mm. And that is why leaders have to work hard at closing the trust gap. And the trust gap is closed by being honest with people, by keeping things confidential, by making sure nothing bad happens to the people who give bad, bad news, that they actually appreciate people, that they close the loop with people. Trust is built over time. So the people who are asking feedback and people who are giving feedback, if the trust gap is narrow, you'll get good feedback. If the trust, back, uh, trust uh, gap is big, you know, you're going to get pleasantries, but you're not going to get the brutal answer. Now, I, 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 I have, you know, uh, an, a rider, as it were, you know, to the question that we asked earlier. Uh, you know, when you are structuring an organization and, and you are looking at names, 
you know, not the systems, do you understand? And um, you look at some names and what comes to your mind is that who do you keep or do you let go? Uh, if you decide not to let go one or two people, you know, uh, because they are saying the right things, but they are not doing what is expected. So now, how do you deal with that? Do you understand? You know, uh, you have a leader in a box that is already has a system on it. Do you understand? Uh, but they are not doing the work, even though they are saying the right things. They go around as if the work is going to be done. Like, I'm the right person, I'm the right fit in this. But the results coming back show that they are not doing what they are supposed to be doing. What do you do with this? When actually, if you are now thinking, do I let go or, or, or what? Yeah, mind you, people on the outside think that they are doing the right things, you know. So when you let go, you have to think of what is the effect because people don't see them as not competent because they speak the right language, they have the right body um, language and all that. Oh, you are, you are talking for on behalf of thousands of people in that question, <laughs> especially in the church world where people know how to be godly and speak the right thing and they, they can uh, have charisma. And well, they... Welcome to my world again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 so and, and they make themselves look so good and if you let them go all of their friends and their family saying he was a wonderful brother she was a great sister she prayed with me and you know when i'm in the hospital she came visited me and all that all that all that happened there that's a very very difficult what we call optics now that is where at the higher level for organizations it is always good to have metrics, that means measurements, and be done, those evaluations need to be done at least three times a year, every four months. So if I was, for example, if I was your youth pastor, I'm gonna make myself your youth pastor. If I was a youth pastor and I'm, I'm charismatic and people love me and everybody loves me, but I'm really not, not uh, delivering what you're paying me to do. So you would say to me, Sam, right now you have 100 students in your youth program. Over the next 12 months, can we agree we can grow that to 150? Yes, pastor, we can do that. Very good. So I'll meet with you in four months and see what happens with that. I'll meet with you again. And if you cannot deliver, but you've got to, the second part of it is we have to remember, I said earlier, we have to over communicate during times of restructuring. I think mm -hmm. you have to find ways of putting the word out there. Sam Chand has, is working hard to get us from 100 to 150. Pray for Sam Chand as he's working hard mm -hmm. to get us from 100 mm -hmm. to 150. Mm -hmm. we, we, you know, Sam is working hard to get us from 150. So when it comes to a place where there's not 150, Everybody knows what the expectations were. So I'm sorry. So I'm not the only one evaluating them at that time. Everybody is able to evaluate them. Exactly right. Because the unfortunate part happens, Pastor Tola, in churches is that we make these private agreements with public consequences. Mm, mm, and mm. you got to take that private agreement and take so next, uh, once you have agreed with Sam that I can move, move it to 100, 150, the executive team, hey, Sam is working on 100, 100 150. The entire staff, Sam is working on 150. Uh, all the volunteers, Sam is working on 100, 150. All the parents, Sam is working on 150. Once in a while, Sunday morning during prayer requests, pray, pray for Sam as he has agreed to work hard to grow from 150 to 100, 150. You, everybody knows the finish line now. So when instead of 100, I have taken it down to 92, everybody knows that I did not know. But if you, if you don't go public with it, then you are stuck with a private conversation with public, uh, private conversation with a public consequence. Hmm. So you got to go public with it. And you, you can do that in a church uh, just like the way I just explained it.
Okay, okay, okay. Thank you so much. Um, one question and we'll let you go. What are the basic things to note when downsizing in an organization? I, every organization that I have worked with in the last two and a half, three years, Pastor Tola, has restructured and downsized. Because one of the things that the pandemic taught us was we don't need all that to do what we are doing. So downsizing is really not the right word. Right sizing is the word. Mm. You are right sizing. Remember I talked about aligning our resources to our vision. So right sizing means, uh, so for example, uh, one of the companies I have, one of the companies I have in which we uh, uh, do media and publishing and so on and so forth, at one time had 45 employees. But we refocused and now we are at 30 employees. We did not downsize, we right-sized. Right-sized means this is where we are or this is where we're going and here are the people resources that we need. Downsizing has that negative con connotation. Downsizing means the business is not doing good, church is not doing well, they're having to let people go. No, we are right sizing. So I have seen churches that have grown during this time and right sized it so they have fewer people, but higher qualified, more competent, and people who are making delivery on what they were expected to do. So mm -hmm. right sizing. So the question for organizations is, at this age and stage of our life, what is the right size staff that we need? Mm -hmm. One of the ways that I think churches can think about is the percentage of their annual budget that goes towards paying people. 35% uh, is average, 50% is red light, 45% is orange light. So that's one way to do that. But I think right sizing is a question every, every, every organization is asking itself, corporate or church. So it's not downsizing, it is right sizing. Okay, okay, okay. Uh, once again, uh, Dr. Samchand, thank you, thank you, thank you so much. I love uh, you, we sir. have more questions, but our time will just not permit, you know, to be able to answer, you know, some of those questions. Uh, maybe what we'll do is that we can we'll email them to you and uh, if you can oblige us to, you know, just type in the answers and then we can put them on our notes for people to you know, see. Them. You know, one thing I've learned about you, you're mm. always making more work for me. Uh, I, I, I'm trying, I'm trying <laughs> because, you know, when you said earlier that assuming you are my youth pastor, I said the average member of the church will be about 80 years old. If you are the youth pastor, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know uh, once again, honestly, you, you have always been a blessing and we really, really, really appreciate you. Uh, we want to thank all the members of your team, your wife, Rachel. We want to, I mean, your wife, we want to thank her. I want to thank Rachel and everybody that is associated with you. You've made this very seamless for us. And um, when I grow up, and I mean that, I, I'm going to be like you, like you like you. One more time, please, let's appreciate Dr. Sam Chand. You know, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you. And God bless you.